This is Victorian London. It's set to become the greatest and largest city on Earth. By the middle of the 19th century, with the arrival of railways, roads and sanitation, the capital had transformed beyond recognition. Mid-Victorian London was a force to be reckoned with. By 1860, its boundaries had extended to the open fields of Middlesex in the north and Surrey in the south. This rich and prosperous capital drew people here in their millions, and as a result, it was bursting at the seams. Just like today, London's roads would have been packed full of commuters. But believe it or not, in the 1860s, the congestion was a lot worse than today. In 1860, 13 and a half million people travelled by train to London Bridge Station alone. But major stations like this had been built on the outskirts of the city. So the only way all those people could get to their offices, stores and workshops in central London was by using its chronically congested streets. But in 1863, those clever Victorians came up with a solution to ease congestion on the streets. An incredible innovation that would transform the shape of London, the underground. And the Metropolitan Line is where it all started. I'm in what was part of the original underground service through the capital. And passing through here were steam engines belching out smoke carrying gas-lit, open-air carriages. In 1863, the Metropolitan Line opened as the world's first underground railway, with seven stations connecting Paddington to Farringdon Street. In its first year, it carried 9.5 million passengers, and in its second, a staggering 12 million. But this underground wasn't exactly underground at all. Stations like this were built using what's called cut and cover construction, which meant that the lines ran just beneath the surface. Effectively, they'd dig a big trench, lay the track, and then pop a roof back over the top. So we're not deep down here at all. But building these trains in drains was impossible without causing a huge amount of disruption on the streets above. And that was a problem. What was needed was a way of digging underground tunnels without causing so much damage. The inventive Victorians came up with the answer. Grab a torch, you can see everything. Abandoned under Moorgate Station is a revolutionary piece of equipment. And taking me to see it is TfL engineer Omar Mohammed. This is it. Yep, right head shield. When you compare this to kind of modern day tunnel boring Absolutely. machines, the technology involved yeah. in that, this might look quite simple, but it did the same thing just in Victorian times. Exactly. It's the same principle used today. The Great Head Shield was the tunneling machine pioneered by the Brunel family. Each miner would dig out the earth from their chamber. The shield could then be propelled forward with jacks and a cast iron lining put in its place to form the tunnel. And, so, and these aren't the original cast iron Yes, lines, exactly, yeah, yeah. It's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. This, Hundreds of years old, yeah. yeah. And they're still doing the job today. Yeah. The Great Hedge Shield is responsible for the first section of what we now call the Northern Line, the first proper tube line that was built by boring a tunnel rather than cutting a trench and putting a roof over the top. By 1890, five tube lines transported millions across the city. In just under 30 years, with their world's first underground system, the Victorians had utterly changed London. By the end of the 19th century, London had solved the problem of easing congestion on its streets by building the underground. As more roads and railway lines were built, thousands of Londoners were forced out into already overcrowded areas on the edge of the city, like the East End. 
by the late 1880s, places like Shoreditch and Whitechapel were crammed with people living in desperate conditions. Here, the old Nickel had become London's most notorious slum. I'm meeting historian Hallie Rubenhold to find out more. So we're looking about 20 streets that made up the old Nickel. And within those 20 streets, there were 653 households that contained 6,000 people. That's huge. Unbelievable. A very poor family might inhabit one room. So we're looking at eight, nine people in a room of about eight by 10 feet. My goodness. I mean, what were sanitation conditions like? The sanitation was absolutely terrible, and, and this is one of the reasons why people were getting sick and mortality was, was so high. In the slum areas like the Old Nickel, the annual death rate was double the capital's average. But after 40 years under Queen Victoria, London had become the head of a global empire and was the richest and most prosperous city in the world. By the end of the 1880s, London's population had grown to over 5 million, and estimates were that a quarter of them were living in poverty. But one man, Charles Booth, a social reformer, thought this must be a gross exaggeration. One and a quarter million people couldn't possibly be living in that miserable state in the greatest city in the world. This was the heart of the British Empire, for goodness sake. So Booth set out to assess what living conditions in London were really like, street by street. He produced an astonishing series of maps. This is the descriptive map of London poverty. So what do the colours mean? The black is what Booth would have described as very poor, semi-criminal, and then we see we've got blue also, which is just a notch above that. Where are we here? Well, we are right here on Commercial Street. We're in red at the moment. What's red? Red is, is, is middle class, it's prosperous. So it's all down the big main roads, but as soon as you get off the main road, we've got black. Booth's maps were utterly groundbreaking in what they revealed about London in the 1880s. He discovered that in this immensely wealthy city, one third of the capital's population was living in poverty. That's nearly two million people. What's startling about this is just the degree of poverty it shows. As the shocking extent of poverty in London was exposed, public pressure increased to fix this problem. And a series of infamous events were about to shine a light on the issue and leave a lasting legacy on the city. When this map was produced, it was right in the middle of what were called the Whitechapel murders. The Whitechapel murders took place from 1888 to 1891. There were 11 murders and five of those murders were committed by the person we've identified as Jack the Ripper. Where we are right here. Absolutely. In fact, we are drinking in the Ten Bells, which is where Mary Jane Kelly, the fifth victim, had a drink shortly before she was killed. So what was their connection to Whitechapel? Whitechapel was, you know, the, the last stop. It was where you sank at the very end of your life. And this is what happened to these women. This is why they were on the streets when they were killed. So these are women who are victims of poverty before they ever became Ripper victims? Absolutely, they were victims of poverty. Poverty is a massive problem in this city. When news of Jack the Ripper's horrific crimes hit the headlines around the empire, the pitiful state of living conditions in London's East End became obvious to everyone. Something needed to be done. And it was. From 1891, right across London, slums began to be knocked down, starting here with the Old Nickel. After decades of expansion and change, the London that emerged in 1900 was a very different city. By the end of the 19th century, London had become the most influential and the most populated city on Earth. This staggering growth had been powered by industrialization and the ingenuity of the Victorians. But in the first year of the 20th century, that chapter in the story of this city would come to an end.